Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to My Movie Story. Uh, so we're at the end of season two, and this is a, a bonus episode where um, basically it's just me. It's a solo video, and I thought it was time to do a video and talk about my three films. You know, I've done 35 episodes up until this point, uh, looked at well over 100 different movies with all of our guests, uh, and people have been asking me, you know, what are my three films? What's my all-time favorite? the film that changed my life and the film I think everyone should see. Uh, so yeah, I thought it was time to sit down and uh, tell you what my three films are. Some of you who know me well and know me closely probably know what those films are. Uh, many of you probably don't know what those films are. So this is to officially wrap up season two. Uh, and yeah, here are my three films. And I'll start with um, my number one all-time favorite movie, uh, which is the 1960 classic directed by Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho. Am I acting as if there's something wrong? She's not missing so much as she's run away. Put me down! Mother! Oh, God! Mother! What are you running away from? She looked like a wrong one to you. It's not as if she were a, a maniac. She just goes a little mad sometimes. Why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. So when and where did I first see Psycho? Um, I actually saw Psycho 2 first before I saw the original. So I was in high school media, year 10, and um, my media teacher showed us Psycho 2. He thought that would appeal more to us and our generation because we were the, the scream generation. <laughs> we were watching slasher flicks. So we watched Psycho 2 and I really liked it. It had a slasher uh, film feel to it. Um, but it was set, you know, 22 years after the events of Psycho. So I, I loved the sequel and was able to follow it without much understanding of what had came before. So not long after watching Psycho 2, I went and rented Psycho and watched it. Uh, and at first I was bored. I'm not going to lie, you know. <laughs> My all-time favorite movie the first time didn't grab me. You know, it was old. It was black and white. Uh, the first half of it was quite slow as we follow this woman, Marion Crane, who's sort of on the run with some money. Then she gets to the hotel and, you know, the famous um, shower scene happens. And that definitely grabbed me. That was quite effective for a film that was, by the time I'd seen it, nearly 40 years old, right? So I went back and I watched Psycho again and again. And, and I started to, like, peel back the layers and see what, you know, what a masterpiece of a film it was. Filmed in black and white. It didn't need to be. You know, colour films were around at this time. Uh, but it was filmed in black and white. And I think Albert Hitchcock did that because he knew it would be more effective and uh, in the scene where Marion is in the um, shower and she gets stabbed, the blood you see running down the drain was actually just like chocolate syrup or chocolate sauce for ice cream. But one of the tricks of the trade being black and white, you wouldn't know what it was. Uh, so yeah, that was when and where I first saw Psycho. So my most favorite or memorable scene from the movie. Um, so obviously the obvious choice would be the shower scene, which I've just spoken about. But for me, obviously, it's the scene where um, Marion is on the run uh, with the money. And she's in the car and she's driving this car. She's just rented. She's something she's traded in her car and she's trying to just cover her tracks. Right. And she doesn't know where she's going. She's driving, she's driving, she's driving. And the camera is just focused on her face and she's playing over what she's done. She's hearing the voice of her boss, hearing the voice of her partner, um, thinking about all these conversations that are happening way back down the road about why did she take this money? Where is she? Where is she going? What is she doing? Right. And then the voices get stronger and louder and the guilt starts to kick in. And you can see the look on Marion's face. You know, she's getting really paranoid, really anxious about what she's done. And then it's all of a sudden it's nighttime. It starts to rain and she can barely see. But, you know, just to happen up ahead in the distance, she sees a faint light and it's the lights of a motel on the side of the highway in the middle of nowhere. Uh, without much choice, she pulls over and discovers it's a place called the Bates Motel uh, it looks like it's completely empty, except there's a house up on the hill. And, uh, you know, she meets the owner, Norman Bates. And this is where the story really changes. So are there any other films I consider are in the same league as Psycho? Um, nothing compares to Psycho. You know, it was completely original and shocking 
before its time. Um, and if you want a little bit more background on on the film and the man, Alfred Hitchcock, there's a great film called Hitchcock with Anthony Hopkins, who plays the director, and his wife, uh, played by Helen Mirren. And it's all about the making of Psycho. So that's really cool. Um, so, you know, like I said, being a teen of the 90s, I was accustomed to slasher flicks. And before I saw Psycho, or around the same time I saw Psycho, I was watching all the Scream movies. I know we did last summer. And then I started going back and working my way through, you know, all the Freddy Kruegers, Jason Voorhees, uh, Michael Myers, which is Halloween and all that stuff, right? And they're fine. They're slasher flicks. They're pretty dumb. They're pretty brainless. You know, they were entertaining. Uh, but every now and then I kept coming back to Psycho. You know, I really developed this taste for the films of Alfred Hitchcock. And Psycho was the first Hitchcock film I ever saw. The sequel wasn't directed by him, but whoever did it did a great job. But after I watched Psycho, I went and started discovering some of these other movies. Like The Birds, I really enjoyed. You know, that's pretty close to Psycho. Uh, Rear Window is another great one uh, with, I think, James Stewart, who's confined to a wheelchair and spies on his neighbours and thinks he witnesses a murder. You know, that was later sort of redone as Disturbia with um, Shia LaBeouf. Um, and then another one is Vertigo, of course, is a, a classic film, but very different to Psycho. Um, I've seen a lot of Hitchcock stuff. I've even seen a few of the episodes from his TV show. Uh, but for me, I always come back to Psycho. Uh, it's It's been my favorite film ever since I started loving movies, and it still holds the number one spot. So roughly how many times have I watched Psycho in my lifetime? Um, to be honest, I can't count how many times I've watched it. It's probably over 30 times. <laughs> Uh, these days, I tend to watch it, you know, around the anniversary. So it came out in 1960. So every 10 years, it's another decade older, right? So it recently celebrated its uh, 60th anniversary in 19, um, uh, in 2020. Uh, you know, and in 2030, it's going to be 70 years old and 80 years old, right? And I think it's still going to be, you know, regarded as one of the best thrillers ever made. Um so, you know, I think after I've uh, released this video, I'll probably go back and watch Psycho. And, and I do enjoy the sequels as well. You know, Psycho 2 is really solid. Psycho 3 got a bit silly. It's very much a slasher flick. Um, and Psycho 4 was just, if you're curious about, you know, um, Norman Bates's childhood and what his mother was like, you can watch Psycho 4. And this was all before, obviously, the Bates Motel TV show that most of you know, starring Freddie Highmore and Vera Farmiga. Um, but yeah, like really it all comes back to the original film for me. So do I have any traditions around how and where and when I watch Psycho? Um, I watch it alone, you know, it's, it's a sort of a private film for me in a lot of ways. Um, I know my wife, Nicole wouldn't be into it. She'd probably be pretty bored. <laughs> so if you're watching Nicole, you know, feel free to ask me if you want to watch it. Um, otherwise I'm happy to just sort of watch it on my own. Uh, you know, I don't get scared by horror movies. Some horror films like unnerve me and get under my skin a little bit. Um, and you know, kind of shock me like smile was one, um, malignant is another great one. Uh, but like with, uh, psycho, you know, I'm happy to just watch it as, as a film buff and I just enjoy watching it, studying it. Um, so yeah, I tend to do it, watch it on my own. And, you know, lastly, what, in what ways does psycho capture the magic and inspiration of the movies? You know, for me, um, it taught me what movies could be and how they could be done. You know, Alfred Hitchcock was an auteur. He was the master of suspense. He was way ahead of his time, and Psycho was way ahead of its time. And I think um, the way it captures the magic of the movies is when it came out in cinemas, and I wish I was around when this happened. <laughs> I hadn't been born yet. Um, Alfred Hitchcock was really... Uh, you know, um, stubborn about the fact that anyone who arrived late to a showing of Psycho wouldn't be allowed into the cinema after it started. Uh, he also suggests as a bit of experiment that people stand up when they watch the movie and not sit down. I haven't tried that yet myself. I mean, it's not a long film. I could probably stand up and watch it if I wanted to, uh, but I haven't actually done that yet. Um, but really, it's just the way it's filmed, the camera angles, the music, the acting, you know, this the way that he just can, builds this sense of dread and foreboding and it just gets more intense and Marion goes down this rabbit hole and you don't really know where she's going to go or where she ends up. Obviously, we all know she gets killed. She's the main character. And that was, again, something that was really unheard of with films of the time, to kill off your main character halfway through the film. And then it switches and Norman, Bega Norman Bates becomes the main character, right? Uh, so there's just so much to love about this film. You know, if you've never seen it, I really recommend you watch Psycho. Um, if you've watched the Bates Motel TV show, but you haven't seen any of the films, you know, go back, start with the original Psycho, work your way up. 
Um, there was a spin-off uh, movie called Bates Motel that was filmed and released in the 1980s starring Bud Court of MASH and Laurie Petty, who you might remember from Point Break and Tank Girl. And this Bates Motel was meant to be like a pilot for a TV show that never happened. And it's clearly a made-for-TV film. Uh, and it's absolutely terrible. I mean, if, if you can manage to actually find it anywhere, I think it might be on YouTube. Um, you can skip that. I've watched it a few times um, just because I I love the whole folklore and mythology of Norman Bates and, and the Bates Motel, uh, but it's pretty bad, you know. <laughs> so stick with the original Psycho and its sequels uh, and the TV show. That's all you really need. Um, so, yeah, that's my story behind Psycho, my number one all-time favourite movie. Uh, and now... But my second one is the film that changed uh, my perspective on uh, who I thought I could be as a young person. And I discovered this film as a teenager. Uh, and this film still holds a really special place in my heart. So we're going to talk about that next. All right, so now onto the second film. And this is the film that I regard as the one that changed my perspective on myself. Right. And in this category of my movie story, I always ask our guests, you know, this film changed you in some way or changed your perspective. You know, how specifically? And some people have said it's changed their perspective on films. It's changed their perspective on um, a time in history or, uh, you know, a part of society or life. But this film changed my perspective on myself. Right. And I discovered it when I was only 15 years old, uh, never planning to watch it or expecting to watch it. Um, and that movie is Wes Anderson's Rushmore. You know, you and Herman deserve each other. You're both little children. War does funny things to men. But you'll find a pair of safety glasses and some earplugs underneath your seats. Please feel free to use them. What do you think of Max's latest opus? It's good. But let's hope it's got a happy ending. Rushmore. Thank you very much. So what's Rushmore all about? You know, you've probably heard of Wes Anderson. Uh, he directs movies with the really sort of quirky oddball characters and situations like um, you've got the Royal Tenenbaums, um, the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou, uh, Hotel Budapest, which like cleaned up at the Oscars a few years back. Uh, Fantastic Mix, Mr. Fox, the sort of claymation film where George Clooney voices the fox. Right. But in his early days, I think it was only his second film that he directed. Um, Rushmore came out in late 98, 1999. And I was hanging out with my cousin at the time, uh, Brendan, if you're watching, shout out to you, Brendan. And Brendan was a big uh, Bill Murray fan, right? He'd seen all the Bill Murray uh, films. And we rocked up to the shopping center one day and I'm like, want to go see a movie? We had nothing better to do. And, you know, this was back in the 90s when you just rocked up to the cinema. You didn't know what you were going to watch until you got there. You just looked at what was showing on the board and you're like, that'll do. There's a, you know, there was films, the film would be showing every half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, and I think I wanted to see something else, but I couldn't remember what it was. And he says to me, we should see Rushmore. It's got Bill Murray in it. I'm like, What's it about? He's like, I don't know, but it's got Bill Murray in it. It'll be funny. And I'm like, okay, I'll go with Brendan's choice this time. Usually I chose the movies that we would go and watch. So off we went and I had no idea what to expect. I hadn't seen the trailers of this film. I didn't really know anything about it. Obviously I knew who Bill Murray was. And then the film started in a really interesting way. Uh, this character, Max, is in class and the teacher's trying to help the students solve this math problem and no one can get it. And they all whisper to each other and say, Max, Max, Max should do it. And there's Max reading like a newspaper, the stock exchange, sipping a little, you know, espresso coffee. And he's like, sure, I'll give it a go. And he gets up and he solves it. And everyone cheers for him, right? But then you realize it's just this dream sequence and it's him in school assembly dreaming that he's this high achiever. And then what we discover in this opening montage of this film is that he goes to this prestigious school called Rushmore Academy. It's a boys' school. You know, they wear uniforms and all that. It's mostly rich kids there. As we come to discover, Max is not from a rich family. But he loves this school. He loves it to death. And he's actually like the founder, the president, the leader, the manager, or whatever, of about, you know, 30 different clubs and extracurricular activities at this school, right? So he loves going to this school academically he's terrible but he's all about you know i'm going to just lap up everything that the school has to offer and that's his life you know rushmore is his life and as the film progresses you know we get to know him he's got these great big goals he wants to build an aquarium at his school and he just goes ahead and starts 
construction without talking to the principal <laughs> and he befriends bill murray um who's the father of two of his classmates and bill murray's like this rich steel tycoon and they kind of become friends uh then max discovers because it's like a prep to 12 like school that there's a um the kindergarten teacher is this lovely young lady called um miss cross right and he develops a crush on her and he tries to get to know her a little bit. And Max is very mature. He's very wise beyond his years. So he can have conversations with adults. Uh, and he feels he relates to adults better than other kids his age, which I certainly felt like that at times as a teenager. And then he develops a crush on Miss Cross, but also Bill Murray's character, Herman Bloom, also falls for Olivia. Her name's Olivia Cross. So they, um, I think, no, sorry, Rosemary Cross, played by Olivia Williams. Uh, so they both sort of fall in love with her and then they're competing for her affections while he's still attending school, writing plays, putting on these massive productions and driving his principal nuts, right? <laughs> so it's a really unique story. Just it's a slice of life about this young kid who's like, you know what, I'm, I've been given this opportunity to go to this school. I'm going to use it to express myself. I've got a lot to say. I've got a lot to offer uh, and I'm going to make the most of it, even if maybe it gets me in a little bit of trouble. And I think the character of Max is just, you know, so fascinating to me. Played by Jason Schwartzman. It was his first film. He's part of the Coppola family. His mother is um, this Talia Shire, the sister of Francis Ford Coppola, the famous director. So he kind of comes from acting and filmmaking royalty. His cousin is Nicolas Cage, you know, so the story, you know, you know the rest of the story, right? Uh, but he's fantastic in the film. Um, and the music is really great. It's got a really unique original score. And um, there's lots of uh, songs on there from from bands from the 60s and 70s that Max tends to like. Um, so that's the film in a nutshell. And uh, I'll talk a little bit now about how it changed my perspective on myself. So how did Rushmore change my perspective on myself? Well, I, I identified very closely with the character of Max. I would say that as a high school student, um, I wasn't very academic. Uh, you know, I showed up, I did my work. I, I, I submitted my homework most of the time. But when it came to like VC and my final exams and all that, I didn't really do very well. Uh, but I, I chose really not to focus on that because I didn't see that was, you know, that at the time that that was my future, you know, after high school. For me, it was about work and travel, and that's what I did. And then later on, I went and got myself educated and, you know, happy with where I'm at now. Um, and really, the blessing for me of high school was meeting all of my mates, right? Uh, but in high school, I did start developing an interest in writing and, and watching a lot of movies, right? And Max from Rushmore uh, writes plays, right? So he's got this old typewriter that his mum gave him. His mum's passed away. Uh, and he writes these plays and he directs them and acts in them. And they're these sort of massive productions. And it's really amazing that, that he gets away with making these <laughs> plays happen at school. Like he almost burns down the school at one point. But they're they're fascinating, right? Um, and I couldn't stop watching Rushmore. You know, as soon as it came out on DVD, I got a copy of it on DVD. Shortly after the film was released, I remember I was, me and my cousin Brendan used to work with my uncle, who was a painter. Uncle Joe, God rest his soul. And he used, he had this gig where he used to go and uh, paint all of the George Palace cinemas in Melbourne, this small chain of fancy cinemas. He knew the owner. So every two years, they would get my Uncle Joe to come back, do a fresh coat of paint in the theatre and in the foyer and all that sort of thing. And we were helping him late one night, and he wouldn't actually let me and Brendan paint because he knew we would just stuff it up. <laughs> so we at one night, we went to him to paint the cinema late at night after it had closed, all the sessions had finished for the night. And we were just like wandering around in the theatre. And we found ourselves this room with all these posters and videotapes, right? Uh, and there was a massive, big poster of Rushmore that they'd had in the, you know, the poster boxes with the lights when the film was showing at the cinema not long before that. And I thought, well, the film's not out anymore. They're not going to miss it. So I pinched a poster. I let my uncle know. He's like, yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll let the guy know. <laughs> so I got that, stuck it up on my wall. Uh, then I bought the DVD. I bought the soundtrack. And I would I was religiously watching this film over and over again. Each time I did, I noticed something different about it, something different about Max, about his character, about the way he saw himself and how he saw himself in the world, his relationship with adults as well, you know, because I was very focused on the adult world. I couldn't wait to finish high school, to be honest. Like I went to a pretty good school. It was handy because it was close to home. I could walk there in two minutes when all my mates had to catch buses and trains. Ha ha. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was really um, a kind of a bore and I couldn't wait 
to get out into the real world and connect with adults. And I was fascinated by that. Like, who's this adult who's living in the world and, and why do they do what they do? And how did they become successful? You know, that curiosity was there for me from a really young age. And I really identified that in Max, you know, in from Rushmore. Uh, and that's why I sort of watched this film and, and connected to him, you know, connected to his like creativity, the, the way he saw the world, how he noticed something about people or noticed a story that other people didn't see was there. And he wrote a play about it. You know, I ne I've never written a play myself, but I was dabbling in writing scripts in my teens and early 20s. Uh, and then moved into writing like short stories and stuff. Um, so I guess the takeaway for me from Rushmore is that no matter who you are or ho how old you are, you know, you've, you've got goals, you've got dreams, you've got potential, and you should try and express that. Even if people don't always understand it or approve of it, or uh, think, think you should be doing something different, you know, you do you as the saying goes. And that, and that's really what I got from Rushmore, um, you know, and it still holds that place as the film that really changed my perspective on myself, probably more profoundly than any other film that I've seen. She's my Rushmore, Max. Yeah, I know. She was mine too. All right, so last but not least, definitely not least, is the film that I think everybody should see in their lifetime. Uh, most people have seen this film uh, and know its secret. Uh, those who haven't seen the film have probably had its secret or twist ruined for them, thanks to YouTube and another little movie called uh, Fifty First Dates. Um, play the clip. I can't believe it. Bruce Willis is a ghost. I'm just, I'm shocked. Did you see that coming? No, nope. not a clue. Doctor's help. Anyway, it was awesome. <laughs> so as you can guess, uh, the film I'm going to talk about, which I think everybody should see in their lifetime, is The Sixth Sense. I think that they know that you're one of these very rare people who can see them. So you need to help them. What if they don't want to help? I don't think that's the way it works. How do you know for sure? Is anyone there? Look out! The Sixth Sense, wow. so 1999 this film came out, and just as a little side note, 1999 was one of the best years for film ever, you know, in, in modern cinema. It was such a landmark film, you had like American Beauty, Being John Malkovich, uh, Run Lola Run, uh, The Matrix, uh, American Pie, you know, so many films that came out that were just like groundbreaking for their time or the film of their generation, and you know, continued to turn out sequels and inspire other films after them. Um, I've actually reviewed the films of 1999 on my blog. I'll share the link below this video if you want to check it out. So it came out in 1999, and uh, Bruce Willis was a big star at the time. You know, the year before 1998, he'd done Armageddon, Save the World from an Asteroid. He was from Die Hard. You know, we all knew and loved Bruce Willis. He was a big draw at the box office in the 90s. Uh, so sad to see what's happened to him uh, in recent times with his, um, his condition. So hopefully... Uh, you know, when he passes, it's peaceful and not painful for him. Big hero, we all know and love, right? He'd done action films, a couple of comedies, but then the trailer for this film came out uh, where he's playing a dramatic role. You know, not the trademark smirk he's famous for. He wasn't, you know, running around with a machine gun like in Die Hard films. He's just this quiet, straight-laced guy who plays a psychologist called Malcolm Crow, who at the start of the film is confronted by an ex-patient who breaks into his house and, uh, you know, blames... Bruce Willis's character for not helping him and shoots him right and then it fades to black and his wife is there comforting him fades to black a year later we see him sitting on a park bench reviewing some notes so obviously he's survived the shooting uh or so it seems right <laughs> and then his new case as a child psychologist is this young boy called Cole played by Haley Joel Osment um and eventually Cole reveals his secret I see dead people Right, he sees dead people. Uh, one of the most famous movie lines ever, and it was the centerpiece of the trailer for the film. If you remember that, you know, I see dead people walking around like regular people, 
And it was so chilling, you know, and that the kid just delivered that line so brilliantly. He was just a prodigy as a child actor, fantastic actor. And then did a couple of other films as a kid and as an adult, hasn't done a, a lot. Obviously, he was um, more successful as a kid, right? Anyway, so that's the story. And then, uh, you know, Malcolm Crow, played by Bruce Willis, is trying to reach through to Cole and understand what, why is he so scared? What's upsetting him? Uh, and then Cole reveals like, well, I see ghosts and sometimes they're angry and sometimes they scare me. Um, and then we do see some of these scenes unfold uh, where Cole runs into some of these ghosts and it's chilling, it's haunting, it's quite scary. Um, but, you know, it all leads to that sort of beautiful realisation at the end. And yes, spoiler, I'm going to re reveal the twist if it hasn't been spoiled for you already <laughs> in this review or otherwise. Bruce Willis's character was a ghost. So when he got shot at the start of the film, he did die. But the rules of ghosts in this film, as, as Cole explains, is that they don't know that they're dead, right? And they continue living and they only see what they want to see. He thinks his wife is just ignoring him, but she's actually grieving and living on her own and not talking to him because he's not there, really there, right? So it was such a clever twist. And the way it was revealed was beautiful and just like, blew my mind right and i went and saw this film with my mates it was like my 17th birthday i think it was and we were all at the cinema and we came walking out because the film ends with the realization that he's a ghost and like he closes his eyes and you just assume that he's crossed over and the film ends and we're all walking out like hang on like what he was a ghost that whole time right and some people might have seen it coming probably older more you know movie savvy people of the time me as this, you know, just turned 17 year old, I didn't see that twist coming. <laughs> I thought it was absolutely brilliant, you know, and I remember everyone coming out of the Sixth Sense saying, you've got to see the Sixth Sense. It's got the best twist ever, you know, even better than the usual suspects. And that has a great twist as well. Um, but you wouldn't, you couldn't tell anyone what the twist was, right? Because it would ruin the experience of the movie. Uh, so yeah, that was my first experience and introduction to the Sixth Sense. So why do I think everybody needs to see the Sixth Sense in their lifetime? Um, I guess, firstly, if you've had the um, twist of this film revealed for you before you've seen it, look, yeah, that is a bit of a shame, but that's the world we live in today. Um, this wasn't happening in 1999. There was no YouTube, no social media. No one was going online telling people instantly, hey, I just walked out of Sixth Sense and Bruce Willis was a ghost, right? Uh, no one did a Homer Simpson, you know, walking out of The Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> saying, wow, I can't believe Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father. <laughs> All these people are like queuing up waiting to go watch the film. So none of that was going on, right? Uh, so, however, if you do know the twist through this video or somewhere else, you can still enjoy and appreciate the film because, because of the way that it addresses the topics of spirits and those who have died and their connection to the living. And there are certain people in the world who have the sixth sense, right? Who have that gift, who are visited by ghosts, who see them, who hear them, who talk to them, uh, or who can channel them through, you know, as in a psychic or medium way. Right. There's lots of different ways that they talk to us, you know, and I'm a believer of that. Um, you know, there are certain members of my family who've seen and heard things that just can't be denied. Right. So the film really addresses that in a really beautiful, haunting way. Uh, but when I first saw it as a 17 year old, it actually scared the crap out of me. You know, there's <laughs> um, despite its beautiful ending that kind of makes you go, like, oh, OK, he's, he's crossed over. He's he's going to heaven now. And Cole's happy happy days right but there are some scenes in the film because look at the end of the day it's a thriller it's a scary ghost movie there are some scenes that are really chilling you know the one that scared me the most is probably when you know little cole gets up in the middle of the night he goes to the toilet and one of the rules of he explains of ghosts is that when they're around and they're angry it gets cold right and he breathes out right and the cold air comes and then you see this figure walk past him in the background and the whole audience jumped i remember as clear as day you know this was 25 years ago haven't forgotten it he goes into the kitchen and he sees a woman there who, who he thinks is his mom but it's not it's some woman she reveals her wrists there's cuts all over her wrists she's um looks really angry she thinks she's talking to her husband cole runs down his hallway hides in her, his tent gets this last glimpse of her looking at him down the hallway it's it's just terrifying right and that really scared the crap out of me right Around the same time I saw Sixth Sense, uh, at night I was home alone quite a lot. <laughs> so my mum and sisters who were home at that time, living at home at that time, were off running the dancing class. Dad was working nights and I would come home from school, usually cook a bit of dinner for everyone, do my homework and, you know, being alone in the house and I just couldn't stop thinking about the Sixth Sense, right? 
And you hear these bumps, these these creaks, these groans in the house. We lived in an old house. And, you know, my imagine, ma imagination just kind of ran away with me. So that that feeling sat with me for a while, this kind of feeling of like, oh, my God, you know, ghosts really are real. And the way that this film describes that and depicts that is just so real and authentic that now in hindsight, I look back and say it's beautiful. It's a classic film. It's a masterpiece. But at the time, I thought it was so close to home that it really scared me. It kind of chilled me to my bone. Um, and, you know, I had to watch it with other people. I was, I was actually scared to watch it alone for quite some time, right? I did say earlier when I was talking about Psycho that horror films don't scare me. But you know what? The Sixth Sense, the first time I watched it and was thinking about it constantly for weeks afterwards, it scared me, right? And then eventually it came out on video and then eventually on DVD in the early 2000s. And I then watched it many, many more times after that. Uh, and the the scares in the film are, you know, still quite effective. And I think for a uh, debut film, I think it was for M. Night Shyamalan, like groundbreaking, what a masterpiece, right? And a few years after that, he directed a few good films, Unbreakable, Signs. Uh, then he kind of wandered and wavered off for a little while and made some real stinkers like The Happening. Have you seen The Happening about killer trees? Like just awful. Mark Wahlberg, terrible. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> And then he sort of bounced back with the visit about the kids that go and visit their grandparents and they filmed on the camera. That was good. Um, he's got a new one out at the time of this recording called Trap, which I haven't seen yet, but I've, I've heard mixed things about it. So, you know, the thing about M. Night Shyamalan as a filmmaker is that his ideas are quite original and unique. And he's always thinking about different ways that he can scare you, but also move you as well. So I'm a big fan of his films and I'll always watch all of his films at least once. Some of them I'll never watch again. Some of them are like The Sixth Sense that I'll watch over and over and over again. So even though I know the twist and it's been 25 years since this film came out, I still watch it for, you know, I guess it's beauty, it's poignancy, the fact that it treats the subject of a connection between the dead and the living in such a beautiful and a respectful way. And that it gives, it shows the journey of a spirit after life and that there may be that time where they're lost, you know, and they haven't crossed over. and uh, They need closure of their own. And there are people here on earth who can help them, you know, just like sometimes spirits can help us as well. You know, so I think that's what the film stands for. Um, it's a classic. You know, what else can I say? If you haven't seen The Sixth Sense, experience it. Even if you know the twist ending, you'll still get a lot out of this film. It is a masterpiece. I think I can go now. Just needed to do a couple things. Needed to help someone. I think I did. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. That's my three films. The film that my favorite film of all time. The film that changed my perspective on myself, and the film I think everybody should see. Uh, so, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode, little bonus episode of my movie story. That's it now for a little while. Uh, season two has has come to an end. Uh, we'll be back for season three a little bit later this year. We'll also have the next um, my movie, my spooky movie story Halloween special and another Christmas special as well. So you know, thanks for all your support and watching and listening to the podcast and you know sticking in there with me. I've had a lot of fun making this. Um, sorry, it's taken me a while to make this one about my three films, but I was a little you know sort of busy making the other episodes. But yeah, glad I finally sat down and made this one to share with you the three films that have changed me in a really profound way and uh, if you haven't seen any of them i highly recommend that you check them out all right thanks a lot guys uh enjoy the movies and see you back on the podcast uh very very soon take care bye